another cellular defect, another DNA defect, which has been indicted in uh, causing uh, a variety of human tumors, a growing number, is our DNA repair defects. And let's just say that there are processes in the cell in which DNA is repaired if it's defective. And let's say that something goes wrong with that repair process due to uh, processes, perhaps defective genes ultimately, uh, which would interfere with DNA sequence being properly checked for correctness, like a spell checker. Well, there's a, a, a type of cancer, this is hereditary, and it's colon cancer, but it doesn't, uh, it's not derived from polyps, that's why it's called hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer, or HNPCC commonly called is a process involving uh, defects, or let's say these three uh, oncogenes have been indicted, transforming growth factor beta, B catenin, or BAX. And in this process, ultimately, the, the uh, processes, the proteins, which are involved in DNA repair are defective. And what do you think might happen if DNA repair is not uh, correct? It might wind up giving rise to abnormal DNA and ultimately tumors. And that's exactly what happens here. And uh, another skin condition, another condition called xeroderma pigmentosum, uh, which uh, skin cancers uh, arise because um, the genes which are involved in fixing DNA damage due to ultraviolet light exposure are defective. And that's why sometimes uh, squamous cell carcinomas develop in these patients. Uh, this process has also been seen with ataxia telangiectasia, a disease in which you have ataxia, so you know, there's some cerebellar defect, as well as uh, abnormally uh, dilated vessels uh, in multiple places. Your eye is like one common place. Um, a gene has been indicted called the ATM gene uh, which causes uh, this type of uh, uh, a problem. I, I was going to make the joke that, you know, I, I, I think my wife has uh, this gene because she's always going to the ATM machine, but it's a really bad joke, so I won't mention it. Bloom syndrome, okay? It's another syndrome in which cancers can appear. It's a rare thing. You could read about it. But in this case, the uh, enzyme helicase is defective, you know, the one involved in DNA unraveling, and you could call that a DNA repair defect as well. Also, people with the uh, inherited Fanconi's anemia have a predisposition to tumors, and DNA uh, repair defects have been seen with uh, Fanconi's anemia as well. Um, let's talk about telomerase now. Uh, a telomere is a part of a chromosome uh, that determines the number of duplications a cell will have during its lifetime. So if you think uh, of a cat that has nine lives, let's say every time it uses up one life, a little part of its tail uh, gets chopped off. And when nine of those segments get chopped off, the cat n runs out of lives, and therefore, he really dies. So let's say that you have a compound called telomerase, which winds up uh, changing those telomeres so that the cell now has an unlimited replicative potential. Well, this is another uh, factor in carcinogenesis. Uh, telomerase is present in well over 90% of human cancers. And as a result, the telomeres can't do their job, and therefore, they can't limit the number of mitoses that that cell has. And this is another molecular uh, factor in cancer. Uh, here's an interesting question. How close to a blood vessel must a cell be in order to live? The answer is about one millimeter. You don't have, a, have to have a blood vessel coming all the way to a cell, but it has to be pretty darn close. The, the fact is, if you're going to have a tumor that's going to be 
detectable, which means more than a few millimeters, let's say one centimeter is generally regarded as a detectable level, you have to have blood going to that. So uh, let's just say that tumors have ways to express the regular old VEGF and fibroblastic growth factor B by which uh, new vessels grow into the tumor. Of course, the vessels don't grow in an orderly fashion. They grow in an irregular fashion, just like the tumor does itself. So ultimately, tumor size is regulated by this angiogenesis uh, process, as well as all of the factors uh, against angiogenesis. So, you know, it's it, it can be a true, uh, correct statement that the size of a tumor is really regulated by the amount of blood it gets. So you have both the angiogenesis as well as the angiogenesis uh, limiting uh, factors as well. Uh, let's get into a, uh, now that we open the door to angiogenesis, let's take a look at this very, very nice diagram. You might not be able to see these here. I could barely see them myself. But let's remember that when you look at these processes on the right here, they have to be in that order. They have to occur before the other one does. So you just can't think that, you know, transformation, growth, invasion, these are nice little terms and you understand what they mean. Remember, they have to occur in a orderly sequence. And that's why we talk about cancer being a multi-step process. Well, we've already talked about transformation. We said that transformation is the process by which cancer develops and ultimately that would be one cell, wouldn't it? Well, that one cell has to grow, okay? Ultimately, it has to invade the contained area that it's in, and if it's a carcinoma, it means it has to invade a basement membrane, which you see here. It then has to invoke some type of angiogenesis in order to grow beyond one millimeter because if it doesn't have blood vessels, it can't grow. It enters a blood vessel, perhaps an artery, perhaps a vein, more likely a lymphatic in the earlier stages uh, by a process called intravisation. These tumor cells, either as groups or perhaps combined with uh, platelets and uh, even lymphocytes perhaps, embolize and they go downstream, whether it's artery vein or lymphatic, they go with the flow to an area and adhere to the surface of the vessel. Once they adhere to that surface, they grow out of the vessel again by the opposite of intravisation, by a process called extravisation. And once they do and they grow again, they take up uh, this metastatic lesion, the whole process is repeated, isn't it? So it's not, I know you already understand all of these processes, but what's even more important is that you understand that one has to come before the other. And these are all steps in what we call tumor progression. So we know that tumor transformation is the development of a cancer cell, and then tumor progression is the growth and invasion and metastasis of that cell. Uh, and that's the processes that we are uh, talking about. Let's talk about invasion now. If tumor cells are going to invade, or let's say if they're carcinoma cells, they're going to perforate their basement membrane or basal lamina, if you were talking about EM, they have to do four things. They have to first detach from each other, they then have to have a stronger attachment to their basement membrane or the matrix compounds. They then have to degrade the extracellular matrix by a variety of methods of which collagenase is the most uh, important, and then they have to migrate. So think of uh, invasion as a four-step process, detachment, attachment, degradation, and migration. And here it is pictorially. We have loosening up between the tumor cells. Uh, the cadherins, which normally uh, adhere cells to each other, are, um, are 
destroyed. They're loosened up. We then have attachment of these cells to the uh, basement membrane, perhaps through laminin receptors or fibronectin receptors. We then have uh, collagenase uh, loosening up the extracellular matrix, the collagen. Now we have migration of the cell. This is the process from which an in situ carcinoma invades. Thank you very much.